Hello. I'm Bart Bartles, Campus Sustainability Manager at Grand Valley State University, and I'd like to introduce the following film clip. It was taken at the launch of the Campus Sustainability Spotlight, which is a year-long project to highlight sustainability efforts by Grand Valley's eight colleges. For the launch, we asked Bill McKibben if he'd be interested in giving a virtual presentation to the Grand Valley State community, and Bill graciously accepted. For those of you that aren't familiar with Bill McKibben, he's an environmental and climate change writer, an educator and an activist. He's author of a dozen books about the environment, including The End of Nature, which is regarded as the first book for a general audience written about climate change. He's also founder of the grassroots organization 350.org and Time Magazine called him the planet's best green journalist. The Boston Globe says he's probably the country's most important environmentalist. Bill himself refers to, uh, refers to himself as a professional bummer-outer, but he does it in a very entertaining and understandable way. It's my privilege to introduce to you Bill McKibben. I wrote the first book about climate change for a general audience, that book, The End of Nature, way back in 1989, i.e. before many of you were born. Um, and since then, I've followed the science and the politics of global warming very closely. It's the most difficult problem that humans have yet engaged in. And I wish I could tell you that we've been wrong 25 years ago or that we've overstated the case that, in fact, the opposite was true. Um, what we've come to understand is the world is changing much more quickly than we could have imagined, even in our worst uh, imaginings. Just to give you an example, a couple of examples from the last few weeks. Uh, some of you may have seen stories in the news about how, what happened in the Arctic this summer. Uh, about four or five days ago, the long Arctic night finally began to descend and the melt season up north ended. Uh, but it left behind a picture like we'd never seen before. There is a 50% less area of ice than there was a couple of decades ago, and about 75% less mass. The, what ice there is is much thinner. Uh, that is to say, if the late Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, uh, had been able to look back this summer as he had 40 years ago, it would have looked like an entirely different planet, uh, 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 half as much white on top. We've taken one of the physics, biggest physical features on this earth and, and broken it. Uh, and really, if you look around, the other physical features of the earth, much the same is going on. The, um, the world's oceans, which are our metaphor for vastness, are about 30% more acid than they were 40 years ago. That's because the chemistry of seawater changes as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. And that makes it very difficult for all those creatures that need to form shells, the, the tiny, tiny microscopic creatures uh, upon which the marine food chain depends. Um, the calcium chemistry of the ocean is their uh, their necessity, and now it's screwed up. Um, for those of us who live near the land, probably the most obvious change is that uh, warm air holds more water vapor than cold. We've raised the temperature of the Earth about one degree, and hence the atmosphere is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago. That is a huge change in a basic physical parameter of this earth. I can't begin to overstate what a staggering change that is. And it's loaded the dice for both drought and deluge. That is, more water evaporates into the atmosphere and hence you end up with drought. And then eventually it comes down and it tends to come down all at once and you end up with flood. And we see both of them in record numbers. You don't need to trust the scientists, if for some reason you think the scientists aren't trustworthy, you could ask the insurance industry, who after all are the people in our economy that we ask to evaluate risk for us. And they've been flashing the, the kind of red 
alert signal as brightly as they can now for some years. Uh, last year, Munich Re, the biggest insurance company in the world, in its annual report said there is no other way to explain what is going on on this planet other than the rapid onset of global warming. Think about this summer in the United States and you get some little sense of what's going on. Probably some of you remember that summer began early. Really, it began uh, in winter. The last couple of days of winter at the end of March were astonishingly hot. Uh, a huge heat wave, a kind of summer in March heat wave built across the Great Plains. It was 94 degrees in South Dakota two days before the end of winter and then crossed uh, 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 across the really much of the country. In Michigan, where it got very warm, as you know, uh, everything went into blossom, all the fruit trees. Um, and then, when there were the completely normal and absolutely expected April frosts, all those trees, all those uh, blossoms die. I, I feel this particularly strongly myself because I am a great lover of cherries. Uh, for which your state is the prime source, and there really aren't very many this year. Um, um, as the summer went on, we saw the biggest wildfires in New Mexico and Colorado history. And then as June turned into July, a heat wave of epic proportion that swept across the country. Uh, we saw record high temperatures in state after state after state after state. We saw the longest heat wave in the history of Washington, D.C. Uh, we saw a huge, powerful, odd storm. The meteorologists called it a Dureco that started in Indiana and swept over 16 hours all the way to the Atlantic seaboard, knocking out power for 5 million people. They called it a kind of straight-line hurricane with winds as high as 100 miles an hour. Uh, and then, of course, that heat helped produce a baking drought of enormous proportion that lingers still 68% of the country in a drought condition at the moment. The result of which is that grain prices have gone up 60% or so in the course of this summer. Now, for those of us, you know, here, that's usually livable with. I mean, if you go buy a box of cornflakes, you're paying more for the box than you are for the corn. So the 60% increase in the price of corn isn't going to do most of us in. But if, like most people in the world, you have to get up in the morning and, you know, uh, dig for coin, you know, find your coins to go buy enough cornmeal from the market to make tortillas for your family for dinner, then, believe you me, a 60% increase in the price of corn is a big deal. Everything that I've described happens when you raise the temperature of the earth one degree. That's how far we've raised it so far. The bad news is that the same scientists who told us that would happen now tell us with robust confidence that unless we get our act together very quickly, get off coal and gas and oil far more quickly than any government is now planning, that one degree will be four or five degrees before the century is out. There's no reason to think that we can even begin to cope with change like that. A team from the University of Washington and Stanford, a team of agronomists, did the basic calculations a couple of years ago. They did not bother to factor in either drought or flood, which obviously makes farming hard. All they said was, let's just look at what happens to our main grain crops as temperature rises, as they go out of the range for which they evolved in the Holocene. This period now coming rapidly to an end. And what they found was that from this point on, each degree increase in global average temperature should reduce grain yields about 10%. You get an easy sense of how that could happen looking at the Midwest this summer. So what that means is we're looking at a planet potentially with 20 or 30 or 40% fewer calories on it. And all of you are capable of doing the kind of mental math to figure out what that would be like, that we could not have development or could not deal with hunger or we could not keep the world peaceful were we to face that kind of situation. We cannot let it happen. It is the most important challenge that we've ever faced and so we best get to work on it 
And that's really what I want to talk with you about tonight, at least for a little while. Um, the work we do at 350.org, which is a, an odd name for a campaign. We took it when we formed 350.org because our greatest climatologist, Jim Hansen at NASA and his team, said, we now know enough about carbon to know how much is too much. Any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is, as they put it, not compatible, not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Now that's strong language to use, and it's stronger still when you know that wherever you are today, Michigan or Mongolia, the average the, the, the atmosphere is about 395 parts per million CO2, already way too high. I mean, that's why the Arctic melts. That's why the Great Lakes approach their lowest water level in recorded history. Um, that's why these changes are happening. Um, when we started 350.org, it was myself and seven undergraduates, so people your age. Uh, here at Middlebury College in Vermont, where I hang out. And we took the name in part because we knew we wanted to organize globally. And one of the obstacles to organizing globally is that everybody on the planet insists on speaking their own language. That makes it difficult. But Arabic numerals get around that problem. 350 means the same thing, no matter where you are. And so we set to work. Now, there we had no money or anything, but there were seven students, and that was the right number because there are seven continents. Each one of them took one. The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet. Um, um, and we set to work, and our work was to find people like ourselves around the world. Um, not everywhere is there a category called environmentalist, but everywhere there's someone who's worried about hunger or war and peace or development or women's rights, or all the things that really you're not going to be able to pursue in a degrading world. So those were our allies, and, and you know, many of them came from religious congregations, or, I mean, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher myself, so that's one of the places I started. Young people dominated in this uh, uh, work. We asked everybody if they would... Uh, on, you know, one day we picked in the fall of 2009, so three years ago, right about now, if they would uh, try and have a big uh, demonstration of uh, where they were. Now, we didn't know how well this would go. We didn't have, as I say, any money or anything. But we got a sense it might work two days early when we got a um, call on a satellite phone from the person who was leading our efforts, the volunteer leading our efforts in Ethiopia. A 17-year-old girl named Lau, and she was calling from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, and she was in tears. And she said, um, the government took away our permit for Saturday, so we can't do it then. We're doing it today before they can stop us. And we're really sorry. We don't want to spoil it for everybody else. And we were so looking forward to doing it at the same time as everybody else. And we're really sorry, and we have 10,000 kids right now out in the street in Addis Ababa chanting 350. So I was, you know, like, well, it's okay, don't worry about the date. You know? um, it, was, it was an amazing, I'm going to try and turn this computer up, and maybe you can see this picture from that, just from the streets of Addis Ababa there. It probably isn't coming out well enough for you to see, but it's one of my favorite pictures of all those young people hard at work. If you go to 350.org, you can see thousands of these kind of pictures. That first weekend, there were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN called it the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. They came from all over. The second one that came in was from U.S. troops in Afghanistan. They made a 350 out of sandbags, and they um, sent us a note saying, we're parking our Humvee for the weekend and walking in order to save, you know, putting that much more carbon into the atmosphere since it's coal and oil and gas to power this trouble. Uh, the pictures are remarkable. They demonstrate, among other things, that one of the things people had told me for many years was just wrong. I, I'd often heard people say, oh, environmentalism is like a luxury for rich white people. If you had to worry where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist. 
That just turns out to be nonsense. Uh, most of the people we work with around the world are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world is made up of. And they're just as worried about the future as anybody else, maybe more so, because the future bears down very hard on you in those categories. Well, we've since gone on to do a lot more of this kind of thing, huge global education. Uh, the estimate is that we've organized 20,000 rallies in every country on Earth except North Korea uh, over the past three years. Um, it's become a very big network, and that's a good thing. That education is extremely important. We've been able to do this work in places where people didn't know about climate change, you know, uh, in China, in India, in Africa, and in the United States, which actually lags behind much of the rest of the world in its knowledge of what's going on, partly because the fossil fuel industry spends so much money spreading disinformation. But it was very, very powerful to watch this happen. Um, that said, we were still, and we are still, losing this fight. Um, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere goes up each year as we burn more, and the um, temperature keeps rising. We're not making progress near as fast as we need to. So in the last couple of years, we've tried to step up our game a little bit to go beyond just education and really try and leave a mark. Last year, we had a big fight that some of you may have heard of over this so-called Keystone XL pipeline that would have come down from the tar sands of Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. And the reason that we decided to protest it was that the NASA scientists said those tar sands up in Canada are the second biggest pool of carbon on Earth. If you could burn all the recoverable oil off tonight, which thank God you can't, but if you could, the atmosphere would immediately go from 395 parts per million CO2, already too high, to 540 parts per million. That's how much carbon's up there. As Jim Hansen, our most important climatologist, said, burn this stuff on top of everything else that we're burning, and it's game over for the climate. So we decided to organize against it. We went to Washington, and we sat in outside uh, Barack Obama's White House. And it turned into the largest civil disobedience action in 30 years in this country. 1,253 people were arrested. Some of us in the first batch of that two-week demonstration spent three days in jail, um, but that was okay. It wasn't fun, but it wasn't the end of the world, you know. The end of the world is the end of the world, and that's kind of what we're working on. We were really pleased that as time went on, um, the president responded to some of these uh, appeals. We surrounded the White House with people in November of last year, one exactly one year before the election, in fact. We surrounded it in a big circle, uh, uh, people shoulder to shoulder, five deep around that mile and a half perimeter around the White House. Um, it was not an angry crowd, just the opposite. Every banner and things was something that President Obama had said in his 2008 campaign. It's time to end the tyranny of oil. In my administration, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow, that kind of thing. Um, so it was powerful powerful day. Um, and four days later, the president said, we will postpone for a year making a decision on this. That is, postpone it until after the election. I, I don't know how it will come out. I can tell you for sure that Mitt Romney has said the first action he would take as president would be to approve this pipeline um, and tap more heavily into those Canadian tar sands. We don't know what will happen with the president. There are no guarantees one way or the other. And Though we learned one very happy lesson from that work, that we could stand up to the fossil fuel industry even with all their money. They are the richest industry on earth. We also were sort of forced to recognize, I think, the limits of that approach in that there are simply too many pipelines, too many oil wells, too many coal mines to go after them one by one and try to end global warming in the short time that physics and chemistry allows us. And so our thought was that we needed to go more directly at the fossil fuel industry itself, try and put a dent in it. Um, so this year, beginning the night after the election in Seattle and continuing for 25 nights in 25 cities around the country, we'll be doing this roadshow. 
that will attempt to kind of spark this new movement to take on the fossil fuel industry as a whole. And one of the places it will be aiming very strongly at is colleges uh, and universities. Um, in part because they have often some endowments, uh, portfolios invested in stocks of various kinds, and we're going to be asking that they not make new investments in fossil fuels, and that over the course of the next five years, when it's prudent to do so, they slowly sell their stock in Exxon and Chevron and Shell and Peabody Coal and, and the other fossil fuel industries. We need to do this because we need to put some pressure on these guys. We need to get them to stop blocking progress on climate change. Uh, at the moment, they've been able in Washington for 20 years to prevent anything from happening. Especially they've been able to prevent the one thing that economists have called for over and over and over again, which is a serious price on carbon. Um, um, something that would reflect the damage that it does in the atmosphere. <clears throat> if we could get that, if we could put a serious price on carbon, then markets could go to work in helping solve this problem. But right now markets can't because they have no information about carbon. This is the only industry allowed to pour out its waste for free. And hence that waste, carbon dioxide, which traps the heat in the planet that would otherwise radiate back out to space, which is the essential problem behind climate change. It just keeps accumulating. And so we need to take these guys on strongly. And, and we hope, and we're pretty convinced that young people will be in the lead in this as they have been all along. So I hope that some of you will start investigating, figuring out whether there are opportunities on your campus and surrounding campuses to do some of that work. And look at other institutions with money too, you know, uh, your churches and things like that. Um, there's no guarantee that any of this will work. This is a very powerful industry and the science is pretty dark, it must be said. Things are happening very fast. But the stakes are so high that anything that could materially change the odds and we think this could, is really important. The precedent, the lesson on which we draw, the last time anybody tried an approach like this was about 25 years ago um, when there was a big movement on campuses across America to divest from companies that were doing business in South Africa. And it was a very difficult fight and lasted a while, but it had significant effect. Places like the University of California system divested $3 billion in companies that did business in South Africa. And one result was that when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison, his first foreign trip, he came to the U.S. and he did not go off to the White House first or the State Department. He went to those campuses where people had done this work and he went to say thank you. I mean, he said, we South Africans liberated ourselves, but you guys were a real help. Um, we need that same kind of um, story here, I think, and let's hope that we can get it. Um, well, you know what? I'll just close so we can do some questions, but I'll close with two stories from that, those arrests that we did in Washington last year, that big civil disobedience action. And it was very civil, civil disobedience. We said two things when we sent the letter out asking people to come. One was, I didn't think that college students should have to be the cannon fodder here. If you're 22 right now in our economy, an arrest record may not be the most useful thing on your resume. One of the few advantages to growing older is, after a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you? <laughs> and so it was really good to see older people coming. Now, we did not ask people as they got arrested, how old are you? That would be rude. But cleverly, we did say, who was president when you were born? Um, and the two biggest groups came from the FDR administration and the Truman administration. So that gives you some sense that your elders are beginning to step up, and hopefully some of your professors and administrators and things will be stepping up, you know, and helping on these fights. The second thing we did when people came was say, um, Please, if you're going to come here and take part in this, be in a jacket and tie or wear a dress. Not because, I mean, I live out in the woods, you can see what I normally dress like. But we wanted to make a kind of 
visual statement, and the statement was, there's nothing radical about what we're asking for, just the opposite. We're asking for a world that works a little bit like the one we were born onto worked. And that's really, if you think about it, a conservative demand, not a radical one. Radicals work at oil companies. If you're willing to get up in the morning and alter the chemical composition of the atmosphere in order to amass record wealth, then you're a radical in a way that no human before you has been. All the things that we can do around us are important. All the initiatives that are going on in a campus like yours are important. I have no doubt that there's a good recycling effort. And people are working on lighting. Maybe they're building new energy efficient buildings. Maybe there are zip cars in the lot. Maybe people are working on bicycling. And all of that is extremely important and I commend it to you. But the message I'm trying to give you tonight is, given the short time we have and the amount of terrain we have to cover, you can't actually make the math work quite that way. You also have to have structural change. And so that's what we'll be aiming for. And that structural change means dealing with the fossil fuel industry. I wrote an article for Rolling Stone earlier this year, this summer. It turned into, the, I think, the most widely shared article they've ever had. It is 100 and 15,000 likes on Facebook now, so I feel very likable. And the, um, the point of the story, which was long and fairly technical, was just that we're really up against it. Um, if we're to hold temperature increases to two degrees now, uh, which is the most that even the most conservative governments think we can get away with, we've already raised it one, and that's melted the Arctic, so two won't be good, but maybe we'll survive it. If we're to hold temperature increases to that, we can only put about 565 more gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. A gigaton is a billion tons. Uh, we burn 31 gigatons a year in the app, and the amount is going up about 3% a year, which means that that gives us about 16 years. Um, if we, that's, so that's bad enough on its face. But the really depressing number in that article, and the one that made me want to write it, uh, was that a bunch of financial analysts in the United Kingdom had done the work of figuring out how much carbon the big oil companies and the countries that operate like fossil fuel companies think Venezuela, Kuwait, how much they had in their reserves. And the answer was that they had 2,795 gigatons, or six times as much, five times as much as even the most conservative governments say would be safe. Uh, in other words, I mean, it's like if the drinking and driving limit is 0.08 and maybe you can drink a six-pack in the course of an evening and still maybe if you're, you know, uh, if you're kind of fat, you know, get away with being um, under that limit just barely. It's not wise, it's not recommended, but you might get away with it just like we might kind of get away with two degrees. If, if that two degrees is the 0.08 and the 565 gigatons is the, um, is the six pack, then the fossil fuel industry has already, you know, popped the top on about five six packs and they're ready to chug them down tonight. And, and you know, there's probably somebody there at your college who would attempt that, somebody on the rugby team or something. But if they did, think about the words we would use to describe their condition, wasted trashed, wrecked, totaled, um, that's what will happen to the planet and the hangover lasts not a few days but geologic time. We have to take away in essence the fossil fuel industry's social license, its license to keep on doing this and that work is uh, inherently involves coming together to demand real structural change. We cannot do it just one by one, one place at a time. And so I hope some of you will be moved to investigate 350.org and, and other things like it and, and get involved a little bit in this fight. We would love to have you. It is the most important battle there's ever been. Uh, it's more important for you than it is for me. I am, if I'm lucky, got another 25 years on this planet. You guys have 60 or 70. And it behooves you to um, try and make it come out okay. Um, um, and if you get into this fight, you will have the one thing I can guarantee, plenty of 
colleagues, comrades all over the world. I've been in every corner of the world the last four years, in every place, including in those countries where people have done nothing to cause this problem because they don't burn enough fossil fuel. There are lots of people willing to go to work. I can't guarantee you will win, but I will guarantee you that we'll fight, and it'll be an important fight. And uh, it'll be an honor just to get to fight it next to you, shoulder to shoulder, and see how it comes out. So I thank you all very, very much for your attention. And if you've got questions or things, I'll try to answer them. But I also know that you've got local organizers there with important things to say. And I want to make sure that I get off the screen in plenty of time to let that really more important work go on. But thank you all very much. Well, thanks so much. Uh, every time I hear you, it's just a little more powerful uh, than the time before. And of course, your information seems to be even more precise and, uh, and just spot on every time I hear you. really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our group today. Um, how about another round of applause for Ben? Um, and as he mentioned, he's now willing to take some questions. So if any of you are interested in asking a question to someone called the, what was it earlier, Bill? Uh, the country's most important environmentalist. It is your, it is your chance. I believe everything you read. <laughs> um, I, I guess I can kind of kick things off with a question maybe while everybody here is thinking of something to ask. Um, my question would be, of the, if I could put my climate skeptic hat on, and I haven't had that on, I think, since I read your first book. But um, for a climate skeptic, what do you think is the most misunderstood um, notion that they that's kind of purported out there, but completely false? Well, uh, I mean, I think that the most the, the most understandable notion is the idea that maybe what we see around us are just sort of natural cycles. Because, of course, the Earth does change over time, you know, and there have been in the deep past ice ages and periods warm enough that, you know, dinosaurs were wandering around in the North Pole or, you know, whatever. Um, and so over big, deep time, that can happen. And when I wrote The End of Nature in 1989, um, that was what scientists were still trying to figure out. Uh, it, they were looking for what an engineer would call the signal through the noise. Climate's a noisy system. Things bounce up and down year to year. Can you find the steady rising signal of global temperature? By the mid-1990s, the scientists were convinced. You know? um, um, but it is hard for the rest of us, I think, to get our minds around it. Um, just because you know, we seem small and the world seems large, but the truth is, we're now putting out endlessly larger amounts of CO2 than, say, volcanoes do anymore or things like that. We've become a powerful physical force on this planet. I read this weekend, and I haven't had a chance to track down the statistic yet, so it may not be possible, but I bet it's pretty close. That each year, the coal and gas and oil we burn on this planet represents about three million years worth of biology, three million years worth of dinosaurs and ferns and plankton and whatever, uh, dying and being compressed. So, you know, the, the, the weird thing would be if we could burn it all and put all that carbon in the atmosphere and it not have an effect, really. Wow. Anyone else? Yeah? You want to, you want to just ask? You want to come up and ask? Why not? <laughs> oh, Bill, um, Gary DeCock, uh, good to see you again. I have a question about um, another misconception, I think, is that science will save us. That there's an engineer someplace, maybe in this college, that's going to come up with a solution so we don't have to worry because there will be some miracle, like there have been miracles in the past, that have solved major problems for us. Uh, are we any closer to anything like that? Uh, should we sure. live in hope? I mean, the, the engineers have really Thanks. done much of their job. You know, we've produced much of the science that we need. There were a few days earlier this summer when Germany, which is the one country that's ever taken this halfway seriously, the one big country, 
when Germany, industrial powerhouse, lower unemployment rate than ours, you know, uh, when Germany generated more than half the power it used from solar panels within its borders, and Germany's far north, I mean, you know, Munich's north of Montreal, um, um, to me that's a pretty good indication that our problem is not technological as much as it is political. Even countries that are burning lots of carbon, I mean, China now produces more CO2 than the U.S., although in per capita terms we remain, we'll be proud to know well ahead. Um, China now produces about 25% of the hot water that people use from solar arrays on the roof. It's a huge, big business there. Um, um, in the United States, that number is less than 1%. Most of it is used for heat swimming pools. So we're not making uh, uh, progress at the point we need to, but the technology is not the stumbling block. It's the power of the fossil fuel industry that gets in the way. Go ahead. Hi, Bill. Terry Trier from Grand Valley. And uh, uh, I guess my call to action, oh, I should ans I answer your question, it was Harry Truman. For me, uh, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, during the '60s, I guess my in environmental awakening came from Paul Ehrlich. I guess uh, mm -hmm. more than anybody. But uh, so it seems like um, five billion people would produce a lot less carbon than seven billion. So your organization and your activities have have you focused any uh, activities well, towards this problem? In my own work, I have. I wrote a book about population called Baby One, an argument for smaller families. But I think that um, population is actually one of the places where we can, maybe the only place where we can say we've really turned some corners. Uh, um, you know, 30 years ago when Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb, the average woman in this world had six children. That number is about 2.4 and continuing to fall. Um, we will see some population increase over the next 30 or 40 years, but that's just because of what we call demographic momentum, young people coming into their childbearing years. Even if they only have one or two kids apiece, the population still grows some, which won't be a help, but there's really not much way around it at the moment. The curious, interesting question is what allowed us to see fertility fall like that? And the answer is that it turned out that any place in the world where you educated women and empowered them to any degree at all, birth rates just dropped like a rock. Um, the question for us is what thing will do that same trick for consumption rates, you know, for the rate at which we use stuff. And the hope is that a price on carbon might play some role. The, the other thing to remember about population growth, of course, is that most of it will come, as you know, in places that use very little carbon. And we forget sometimes how big the gulf is uh, in wealth in this world. The statistic I saw not long ago was that the average American uses more energy between midnight on New Year's Eve and dinner on January 2nd than the average African uses in the course of a year. So you can have an almost infinite number of Tanzanians without it screwing up the climate. Um, it's consumption you really have to worry about there. Wow, great. Anybody else? Oh, here comes one. Bill, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry if you were lacking in the uh, audience participation. I had to mute the mic for a while during your talk. So if you're wondering why some of your lines didn't get the laughs they usually do, that was why. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was just wondering if um, you might know if it would be like more um, proactive to, I mean, I know neither of them are like bad, but which one would be better to like maybe, maybe like use less energy or convert to a renewable energy source or to like do go on the opposite end and like plant like a tree? Uh, like okay. wh which is like there's really, there's more really effective? There's three options there, okay, and all of them are good. The first one, use less energy, I should really talk about more than I did. Conservation and efficiency is just by far the easiest way and cheapest way to make really rapid progress. And the reason is that we use waste insane amount of energy. You 
can tell that because the average American uses twice as much energy per capita as the average Western European, who lead lives that are at least as good as ours, you know? Um, so that conservation and efficiency is easy. And we're beginning to get the hang of it, you know? It's uh, just beginning, but it's very good to see that Detroit is hard at work trying to build uh, automobiles that will get 54 miles to the gallon by 2025. I'm in the market for a new car now, and I see that the Ford Fusion plug-in hybrid is supposed to be available by December, and I hope my current car can hold out that long, because I'd like that 100 mile a gallon Ford Fusion if I could have it. Um, and the same with our buildings and so on and so forth. Renewable energy is also very important. Uh, for the reasons that I described. We're going to need to power our lives somehow. And, you know, one of the very good things about, say, oncoming electric cars and, and that kind of stuff is that we can power them straight off the sun, straight off the wind. Uh, we don't need to go through the process of digging up a lot of stuff and burning it to, to get there. Um, planting trees is also useful. Trees sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, our problem is that there aren't there's not enough land mass left to plant the trees to make trees. <laughs> some it certainly doesn't hurt, uh, but it's not a silver bullet either. Uh, in fact, there really are no silver bullets for this. Uh, our, our hope is that there is enough sort of silver buckshot lying around that if we pick it all up, uh, we'll have enough. That's great. Thanks very much. I think that's it for the questions on All this right. end. So, uh, Thank you guys so much, and, and I hope that you'll go and check out 350.org for no other reason than to see what people your age are able to accomplish. So, uh, um, it's, been a great, it's been a great pleasure, Mike, to get to work almost exclusively with young people for a long time now, and uh, uh, you guys are going to have to deal to a large degree with this, but the rest of us will help you as much as we possibly, possibly can. So thank you all very much. We sure will. Thank you once again, Bill McKibben. <laughs> Bye -bye.